Hello, my name is Gareth Hart, I'm the Director of Iridescent Ideas Community Interest Company and I'm here to do a presentation today about legal structures for community groups and social enterprises in the voluntary sector. So if you're thinking of setting up uh, a community project of some kind, then this workshop is for you. It will talk through the pros and cons of different types of structures that you could use uh, to get you up and running. So as I say, I'm the director of Iridescent Ideas, and this is part of the POP Ideas service, which is a, a business advice and funding advice system scheme run by uh, both POP, the Plymouth Octopus Project, and Iridescent, and it's funded by the Esme Fairbairn Foundation. So just to give a little bit of background, my company, Iridescent Ideas, I founded in 2011, and we give a lot of specialist startup advice on legal structures for social enterprises, specifically community groups, voluntary sector, uh, etc. I've worked in the public sector and the private sector, doing a lot of work advising businesses on startup. And today we're going to be looking at the basic legal structures that are available and the pros and cons and some key issues. We're going to be looking a bit about governance, why it's important and what the key principles of being a trustee and a director. We'll look at some of the examples and also we'll talk a little bit more about just general kind of policies and procedures. So as I say, Pop Ideas is funded by ESME and we provide funding advice and business planning advice on a whole range of topics plus workshops. OK, so. Moving on, firstly, then, the really important things to start with are finding a legal structure that's appropriate for your business. And that sounds obvious. I suppose also the first thing is actually don't worry too much about the legal structure. Get your business and your project right first to get the need and what you're doing and the legal structure can follow later. But for most of the organisations we work with, you're going to see some kind of social, environmental or community objective written into the governance and the, the, the sort of DNA of the business, if you like. And also, you're going to see that most of the organisations we work with are not for private gain. So you will see restrictions on profit distribution or on asset distribution. And that's the same whether you're a, a community interest company or a charity or a community benefit society. Uh, the st structures that are commonly used for the voluntary and social enterprise sector. So there's some basics. Also, when we talk about social enterprise, it's important to note there's no legal definition of a social enterprise. It's really a way of doing business. But what you will see in any social enterprise is at least two of these things, probably all three. One is, again, that mission lock. So written in the governance, a, a sort of a statement which declares the social impact you're trying to create. And also alongside that is a profit, a lock on profit. So it's specifically saying the profits are kept for the good cause and not dis distributed to shareholders, or at least 50% are kept for that good cause. So you can say a majority of the profits are used to achieve an impact. And then sometimes you'll see an, what's called an asset lock. And this means that any assets the company owns, if it closes down, have to be given to another similar good cause. Now that is um, a little bit more optional. There are some definitions of social enterprise that don't include an asset lock, but I don't want to get too technical here. But most of the forms we look at will have an asset lock. So if you think about when you start to run a community project, there are often key moments where governance comes into question or where you need to rethink about what you're doing and how you develop your business. So you might start with a group, small group of people or just you're on your own um, and you might not need it very much governance at all. You just get on and do some stuff. Um, but as you grow, if you apply for grant funding, certainly grant funders will want to see uh, sort of usually a minimum of three directors or trustees on the board of a business. They'll want to see policies and procedures and basics in place to run and manage the money. Uh, they need a bank account and normally a constitution of some kind, a set of rules which lays out how the organisation is run. So that, that's some basics. And then if you start to employ people, clearly then you're stepping up in terms of policies and procedures and the governance and the legal duties of your business. If you take on premises, again, you've got more insurances and other things to think about. And if you were starting to tender for larger contracts, you would normally expect the commissioning organisation to be asking for quite a lot of detail on the governance of the organisation. Um, a lot of this is about being commensurate with the complexity of your work. So if you're running multi-million pound contracts for the NHS, there's going to be a, a greater degree of scrutiny on the governance than there is if you're running a £10,000 lottery project. So, so bear that in mind. So what are the key things to think about when you start? 
a whole range of them really and here are really just some of them so one of the key things is about control who's going to own the business and you know who wants to be in charge of the day-to-day -day decision making um, where's money going to come from to start the business what sort of investment are you going to be putting into the business to get it up and running where might that be found is it grant funding is it your own personal money is it donations is it a loan from the bank or from a from an investor um, and a salary is an important one if you personally need to draw a salary from this business it might push you down a certain route whether you need to become an employee of a charity or whether you can become a director of a company um, yeah what sort of assets will you have are you being given assets will you have any assets at all or not and um, what might happen to those um, when will income be generated from and what are the tax implications for that will you need to pay corporation tax or are you going to get donations and you want to look for gift aid on that and another one is about liability so the owners of the business usually have some degree of liability if things go wrong in the worst case scenario what are the maximum liability you would face if you're running a, a, a business and also the thing about transparency you know how open are you to public scrutiny how much do you want your books to be examined a lot of the forms we look at are on public record so so bear that in mind so all these things we're going to talk through today as, as we go through this talk so one of the principal um, things to discuss at the beginning is whether you want to be an incorporated or an unincorporated structure so what that really means is if you're incorporated you, you run your business through a corporate entity which is actually a separate legal thing in its own right it's almost like another person in the room um, which is separate from the owners of the business so if you look at my business iridescent ideas cic we're a company we have two shareholders but the company itself is a legal entity um, it's usually a company or a, or a charitable company a charitable incorporated organization or a community benefit society and really it's also giving you some protection and liabilities an unincorporated group is where it's just really a collection of a group of people or an individual like a sole trader or two people or a few more in partnership and um, these are uh, collections they're not separate legal entity in their own right they're just a group of people come together to work together and so the pros and cons there are quite important so an incorporated group can hold assets in the name of the company or, or the incorporated structure whereas if you are unincorporated structure you have to think about kind of holding trustees you have to have the, you know, the, the individuals named on these sort of on the who owns the assets particularly these buildings and land um the big advantage is this thing about limited liability normally that's a uh, liability that's restricted restricted to a no notional fee a pound if you're a member of a business if you're a shareholder in a business it's the amount of shares you've got in that business I think incorporation does provide some more certainty for stakeholders so you have a company number or an incorporated uh, structure cbs type number or whatever um, i think organizations like to know they're dealing with that more robust structure there are some downsides of incorporation it does cost to do it you have to register with companies house or the charity commission or the financial conduct authority and there's a fee for that if you started as a unincorporated association and you transfer to a new incorporated organization you have to close one down and do a sort of bit of an administrative process to transfer assets in that can include things like contracts um, insurance funding you've been careful of with, with, with funders where the money is coming to they sometimes don't like to see changes of legal um, responsibility but you check with every funder um, some company structures and charities have more accounting costs certainly you probably will have more more regulation if you choose a charitable incorporated model um, and as i say before you will have more scrutiny because for example charity commission um, all public documents like accounts are filed online that anyone can download so you, and you know you will be um, exposed to, to that so but, which I personally i think is a good thing but some people might, might want to think about that so ownership money etc profits we've talked some of about these considerations already but i think some of the key things one of the things is ownership really um, if you want to own and run the business and be in charge of it and also be paid a salary that's going to push you down a certain route it's very hard for entrepreneurs to, to found charities and then retain significant degrees of control because if they are they become an employee of a charity 
um, and then they have to find trustees who are the ones who are ultimately responsible for the business and that can be problematic it can also be a great relationship and you know charity founders i know have said having trustees to hold them to account has been a really good experience that's really important where the money comes from the revenue and investment is quite important so if you are going to be going down the route of getting lots of grant funding um it might be better to be a charity because charities can access more grant funding than say community interest companies um yeah, that's something to think about another thing is about salaries if you're going to be paid a salary as a director you need to declare that if you're a cic um, corporation tax isn't is payable on community interest companies and on cbs's that aren't charities but you know charities are exempt from that so bear that in mind that that's a significant bonus for being a charity if you're going to be trading in a social enterprise it might be that you need to be careful about the charity structure because charities can trade but there are some restrictions about that compared to say a community benefit society or a um, community interest company a cic we'll talk through the, the detail pros and cons as we go now these are some of the common structures you will see in our um, sort of social economy world if you like community interest companies or cics sometimes called kicks um, you have registered societies. These are what used to be called industrial and provident societies covering mutuals and cooperatives, community benefit societies, friendly societies, credit unions, etc. You can run a business as a normal company. Um, this is more common in the social enterprise world and you would expect to see extra layers of governance in there to prove you're a social enterprise. There's all the different charity structures with or without trading arms. Um, cooperatives and mutuals, as I mentioned, they can be different structures. So a co-op can be a company, it can be a registered society. Um, and you get a handful of PLCs, normally very big companies, so very kind of unlikely to see those at this level. But you know, it could be something you want to aspire to in the future. So let's get into the, the detail of the uh, community interest company model. So this is a company. It's an incorporated body. You register it with company's house and there are two main structures one is limited by shares which means you have shareholders so think dragon's den the people who own the shares own the business and then the voting rights are allocated according to that shareholding or you can have one which is called limited by guarantee and that's where the owners owners of the business guarantee a notional sum of against the liabilities if the company was to wind up so they're the two main options and within that there are a large membership model where you have lots of people electing a board of directors or a small membership model where you have a core group of people who are, who are starting the business the small group one is the more common one um, and, the, and the limited by guarantee small group is the most common of all so what are the key features of a cic so they've been around since 2005 um, i think it's fair to say they've emerged as really a, a, a solid model for social enterprises and social entrepreneurs they have these two really important key features so you are creating this company structure, but you have to exist for community interest. So you have to declare that when you start a CIC. We'll look at the process in a minute. Um, you have to have very clearly who is your community of interest. It can be geographic, it can be by interest. And then you have to say what you're doing and what the benefits of the work you bring are to that community. Um, and the CIC regulator, which oversees CICs, We'll ask a question which is would a reasonable person think what you're doing is in the interests of the community being served particularly <laughs> i'm not sure they define unreasonable but there you go would a reasonable person think what you're doing is in the interests of the community so it's a very very light touch test compared to say charity um, they also have what's called an asset lock talked about that a little bit already it means that the any assets the cic owns have to be kept for social purpose and if it closes down, you normally name another CIC or another charity that those assets would go to. Um, it's something really important to consider, particularly if you're an individual starting a business and you've got a lot of personal equipment or assets that you want to um, put into, um, into the business or, or keep outside the business and to be careful there. Some of the advantages of CICs are they're really quick and easy to set up. You can do it online for £27 or you can do it um, offline for 35 It's a fairly straightforward process. A really great benefit is you can pay directors. So I talked about ownership a minute ago. So you can be a director and a shareholder of a business and be paid to do and run that business and, and you're in charge, but also drawing a salary um, of some kind. So that's really important um, for some people. The CIC regulator is what I would call a light touch regulator. They are quite keen to let you get on and run your business as you wish. 
they are um, not particularly onerous they will they can intervene they do have powers to intervene but you do have much more sort of um, freedom to get on and trade and do and run your business but some of the downsides of CICs particularly compared to charity is that you don't get the tax breaks that charity get so you have to pay corporation tax on profits you have to pay business rates you don't get a mandatory exemption you have to you, you won't get gift aid on um, by donations etc there are some grant funders who will only fund registered charities so CICs can, can suffer there as well compared to say charities but great model works for effectively for some people and a lot of uh, interest in this four things about 14 fifteen thousand now on public record um, you know it's a very strong robust model and the process for forming CIC is you complete what's called a CIC 36 form that declares the community of interest your activities the benefits you bring that community plus what happens to profits and assets you complete a company's house IN01 form which is a core company document setting out who owns the business who are the directors who are the people with control of the business you would complete the memorandum and articles of association for the business there are different models you can download on the CIC regulators website so again shares guarantee large or small membership and now you can also now do this all online you can send it all off on paper to company's house but you can also do it online um, as long as you've got those documents ready to go it's quite a straightforward process and you could be up and running in you know a few days if you're lucky um, if you do it online it's really quick obviously if you do it by paper it might take a, a week or so and if there's a mistake the company's house and the regulator will come back to you with some more questions on to charities so the idea of a charity has been around for hundreds of years and you know 1604 there's an elizabethan preamble to an act which started to establish the idea of charity and it's a very well established model in in the uk and across the world a charity if you're going to form a charity there are different types of structures you can choose so a charitable company a charitable trust an association or a fairly new one called a charitable incorporated organization um, I'll look at those in a little bit more detail in a minute. So the key features of charity is you must exist for charitable purpose. And these are quite tightly defined. Um, there used to be four core purposes, things like relief of poverty, promotion of education, promotion of religion, and other charitable causes, which is in, can include things like you know, community regeneration, environmental protection, um, and, and other sort of regeneration topics. But there's a big long list on the Charity Commission website. You also have to exist for public benefit that means as it says you have to be shown that you'll bring a benefit to people and there's enough people enough public that benefits accruing to so if you if you have a very very narrow group of people that you're benefiting um, you might fall foul of that so bear that in mind some of the great advantages of charities are you get a lot of public understanding and trust of charities Yeah, that public trust is really important. So a lot of people understand charity, you know, people run marathons and donate to charities and, and don't really have to question that that is going for a good cause of some kind. You certainly get a lot more funding options. Um, you know, you get the gift aid on donations, you get legacies, you can get uh, many trusts and foundations will only fund charities and you get massive tax benefits as well. You know, no corporation tax, mandatory business rate relief, some business rate ex uh, VAT exemptions, uh, gift aid on donations, etc. But for those benefits obviously there are much more regulations compared to say a cic the charity commission is um polices those benefits quite quite strongly so yes you know you, trustees have quite significant duties and reporting duties uh, to the charity commission um, there are some restrictions on trading as well for charities and that charities can trade for primary charitable purpose but if you are selling other things on the side of the, the business or not linked to your core purpose it has to be at a very low level or being put into a, a charitable trading arm which can increase bureaucracy and as I mentioned earlier on the charity model can be a bit difficult for particular entrepreneurs who want to earn a salary and run the business and be in charge of the business because if you want to draw a salary normally you have to be an employee of the charity and um, trustees can be paid expenses but aren't usually paid a salary for being a trustee there are some exemptions you need to get permission from the charity commission for that but you know charities are it's a brilliant model been around for hundreds of years and very very um, well known in the uk and very common in the charitable in the, in, the, in the voluntary and community sector world as well the new kid on the block is called the charitable incorporated organization 
this was this came about because charitable companies found they had to report to two regulators they had to report to companies house and the charity commission and that increased bureaucracy so the idea was to incorporate an organization to get that kind of um legal entity but with one regulator the charity commission same features apply you have to have charitable purpose you have to have public benefit you still get a charity number so they're treated exactly like charities there are two core models an association which is a wide membership organization which uh, elects a board of trustees or a foundation model which is where a small group of people come together to create a charity um, yeah some of the advantages there they are uh, you have that one regulatory route um, so that bureaucracy is reduced and you can register a, chari a charitable incorporated organization a CIO without any income so you can go straight into um, having a charity number but it's still fairly new and there has been some suggestion that some banks that can't quite get their heads around it and have been not so keen to lend money to CIOs or they I think as time goes on that becomes less of a problem and existing charitable companies can't convert to a CIO as far as I know at the moment that again may change so CIOs probably if you're going to register a charity if you're if you're not a, a really small charity um, CIO is probably the one to look at because it's um you get that single regulatory route um, the other form I'm going to touch on is called a registered society. So this is more about community benefit and is better used in things like cooperatives, community pubs, community shops, where you've got a really strong community of interest in your in your project. Um, this could be work really well. And the common models you'll see are community benefit societies, which can actually be charities as well, um, or, or cooperative models. Slightly different in the fact they're regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority. Uh, not the com not company's house and not or the charity commission um, it is incorporated and you can have an asset lock there as well you have to exist for community purpose if you choose the community benefit model one of the real significant benefits of this model is it can raise public finance through what's called community shares so this is a way of it's almost like crowdfunding investment to start the business um, and you'll see you know, quite a large sums of money being raised we'll look at a couple of examples in a minute um, Community benefit societies can gain charity exemption, so they can be treated as charities for things like corporation and gift, corporation tax and gift aid. Um, but that can be quite a significant benefit. Um, they also are very democratic. So I mentioned about shareholding for companies. If you've got more shares, you have more control. Whereas in this model, um, it's one member, one vote, irrespective of the shareholding. But that, you know, obviously can bring some potential conflicts in that, you know, people want to retain certain degrees of control. That democracy is quite hard to manage for some people. Um, sometimes having lots of members can be quite problematic in terms of things like getting them to make a decision. Power can be um, dispersed too widely and you can't get people together to be core to make decisions. That can be a process to manage. There are some administrative costs that you need to consider. And if you do have community shares, you have to be careful of the restrictions on these. So um, you have to give quite clear um, guidance on how money can be taken back out of the business. But, you know, really interesting model and probably, um, you know, could be used more actually in the, in the world of uh, community projects, because it's a great way to really have democracy and raise cash in the public domain. It's a bit like, a, bit like a crowdfund type uh, way of raising money. Um, but yeah, so watch out for those. They're the three main ones, CICs, charities and registered societies, particularly the community benefit society. They're, they're the most common models you'll, you'll see. Um, the other sort of basic one, if you want to start off, is what's called um, an unincorporated association. And this is where you basically have a set of rules, a really simple one or two page constitution, which sets out what the business is, what the objects are, what happens to money, what happens if you close down, how it's run. Who, who, who manages it and that's really really simple um, you know and, and what a lot of those businesses when they start if they're turning over under under five thousand pounds you know might be deemed or treated as a charity but they don't have to apply to the charity commission um, but you know it's it's a it's a simple first step if you want to get things right up and running with your community group and you can um, you know apply for bank accounts and stuff with those as well so that's bear that in mind for a first step Look at, look at some examples. Um, the Eden Project in Cornwall is a, a charity with a trading arm. So the trading arm runs the site, takes all the money from ticket sales and um, shop and any commercial income and gives profits to a core charity which has 
very strong social and environmental aims. You know, big business down in Cornwall, sort of uh, very well known social enterprise. Some other examples, 15 restaurants, Jamie Oliver's 15 in Cornwall, still going, um, is again trading on with the charity. Uh, you've got Cafe Direct as a, as a PLC, a lot of very large business, but so a bit more um, unusual, but it can be done that way. I mentioned my business, Iridescent Ideas. We're a CIC limited by shares, two shareholders who own the business. We have but four directors who sort of run the business on a day to day basis, which include two of the directors, um, but two other directors who are non shareholders. Smart Savings is the other one, the limited by guarantee model, which is uh, 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 ethical finance. CIC based in Cornwall um, and they have a couple of members who, who own that business. Plymouth Energy Community is a community benefit society based in Plymouth and it raised money, multi-million pound money for um, putting solar panels on roofs of schools and uses the community benefit model really really effectively. Uh, it's a very democratic sort of structure. Um, and then you got into the more mutuals and co ends. So I've got John Lewis here uh, which is owned by the employees and the video is obscuring what the, the cooperative if you've got a you know the cooperative shops are owned by members so they are um, in that kind of cooperative economy which is part of that wider social economy so let's just quickly look at duties and responsibilities of the people who own and run these businesses so if you're a trustee of a charity just bear these things in mind in the pack guide pack pack of information that says uh, in the pack of information accompanying this presentation uh, are some um, handouts and resources which include a very simple outline on the jigsaw puzzle of what the trustees duties are but it's, some of this is really common sense really but you know you are responsible for running the organization you've got to make sure you stick within the constitution and use assets and money for the charitable purposes of the business you accept that responsibility you've got a duty to act reasonably and prudent, prudently um, and safeguard the organization really act collectively declare cons conflicts of interests and act in the best interests of the organization so that's a really important one when you're sat at the board of a, as a trustee in that moment you are acting as a trustee and you've got to act in the best interest of that organization director's duties if you're a company uh sort of broadly quite similar you know there are specific duties again there's a, there's a small booklet with the uh information here which is about the director's duties promote the success of the company, judgment, skill, care and diligence, uh, declaring interests, avoiding conflicts of interests, not to accept any benefits from third parties. So again, you know, sounds pretty common sense in terms of how you run the business um, in good faith and um, with good skill and care. A lot of this comes back to managing money as well, making sure the money is managed effectively for the benefit um, of the, the company's objectives extra bits of uh, guidance if you want to download some information uh, guide to being a trustee from the charity commission cic governance um, and company's house governance as well guidance as well these links you can download more information um, particularly the, um, the the essential trustee booklet if you want to download that for people who want to become trustees of your charity um, the governing document of the business can be called different things As I touched on, the, um, the governing document can be called a, a constitution or a set of rules if you're a community group or a small business or an association. Um, it can be called the memorandum and articles of association for a company, a set of rules if you're a registered society or a community benefit society, the governing document if you're a charity or a trust deed. It can be called different things, but this document is really important because it sets out all the key features about who owns the business, what happens to money, what happens when you shut down and where the assets might go, how you appoint the managing board or the directors or the trustees and how that operates. So it's a really important document to get yourself familiar with if you're going to register any kind of business. It's often written in dense legalese and it's quite painful, but familiarising yourself with the key principles of that is, is really important. Um, the regulatory regimes are a little bit different for each model. So a company has to submit an annual return and accounts to company's house but that's pretty much it a charity has to do something similar with a bit more information on it uh, it's a charity to the charity commission cic's have to do what companies do with an additional form called a cic 34 form this is uh, where you declare what you've done as a business the impact you've had how you've consulted your community of interest what you've done with any money and assets so it's a little bit more regulation every year 
uh, compared to a normal company. And the registered society also does an annual return to the Financial Conduct Authority. So to bear that in mind, annually, there will be sort of um, key documents you will need to produce um, to, to prove you're delivering um, a community benefit for whatever, whichever model you choose. In practice, governance is really concerned with the overall direction and the effectiveness of the organisation, you know, how you are supervising staff and um, using the assets, how you, who you are accountable to, some examples here, you know, accountability could be to funders or regulators, members if you have membership, wider stakeholders if you are a community interest company, for example, you are responsible for developing the right policies and procedures and implementing and monitoring those policies, updating them as the law changes or as your business changes. And then more kind of operational strategy, you know, what's what's the what's the business going to be trying to achieve? The vision, the direction, how you allocate resources, the budgets, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and then on, you know, how then are you performing against that strategy? How are you uh, managing any risks or the impact, the effectiveness, social impact, what you're achieving? Um, and in the core there, you know, you think about your governing body, who's going to be on your board. You know, you normally need at least three people if you're going to start running a business that's going to be applying for funding or contracts. You can set up a company with one person to start with and you appoint more later. Um, but think about that induction policy and process of getting new people on. And we've got something called non-executive directors and they are volunteers who come along, we can pay them expenses and they provide some real great oversight and good questions for us as a board. You know, and develop, developing the governance and the policies and procedures of your business depends on the nature of your work. And I would advise most businesses to have this column on the left here, the basic equal opportunities, health and safety, how mon money is managed. Um, if you're going to be working with young people, obviously safeguarding and child protection. And as you grow and develop, or you know, specific elements of your work might become more important. Developing an environmental impact, data protection type policies. If you start employing staff, certainly a whole set of HR policies you will need. Um, quality assurance and you know if you start tendering for larger amounts of money you're going to be expected to have more and more policies for the for running your business like, you know you can download model documents and, and, and amend these to suit be careful with models you know there's that famous case of the of the um, shipping company that only had the, a, a policy that was for a pizza delivery company and won a government contract so you can get scrutiny on those um so bear that in mind but um you know Horses for courses, really, be commensurate and proportionate with the complexity and the work you're doing. And you know, if you're working, say, with children or in the health sector or in social care, you know, you're going to be specific with policy requirements for your work. Some great resources out there. Some are attached to here. Some pros and cons document uh, on the, in the rainbow chart, I call it, plus my own document I've written explaining some of the pros and cons. There's some doc documents on governance from here, on good governance in the National Council for Voluntary Organisations. If you're looking at setting up a co-op, UK co-ops has some great information and Know How Nonprofit is a really good Wikipedia of all things to do with governance and leadership and running voluntary and community and social enterprise groups. So here are my contact details. Um, if after watching this video you've got any questions, I'm sure you have, about the uh, real sort of detail of a specific legal form or the pros and cons in more sort of specific to your requirements or your issues please get in touch drop me an email give me a ring i'm very happy to take information take questions uh, as we and, and as you sort of as you need them um a pop idea service can provide some one-to-one -one support as well if you want to sit down have a cup of coffee and talk it over in more detail but as i say you know get the business right first what are you running what are you doing what's the need and that the legal structure can follow but it does have important implications for how you run your business um, but you know, I think you can change things. You know, if you get if you get it wrong or you're not sure it's working, you can amend your, your legal structure at a later date if you have to. Obviously, it's not ideal, um, but you can do it. Anyway, I hope you found this useful. It's a bit of a whistle stop tour of legal structures and governance. As I say, keep in touch and good luck with your businesses. Thank you very much. Goodbye.